Hi, I'm Nazneen. Um, basically, I'm just going to explain how we're going to do this. Um, well, we'll just uh, give us a, a couple of minutes just to let you know who we are and what we do. And uh, then um, Shahida will be talking a little bit about historical kind of. In, she'll be giving a historical introduction to who the Lashkars were. Um, and what they were doing in East London in the Victorian period. Um, then I will talk a little bit about my recent research on a, a project that, at the University of Oxford, and which has been looking at Islam in Victorian East London as part of one of the elements of the project, and and how that's related to Lashkar's. And then Shahida will talk a bit more about her novel, Lashkar. And um, then we will take questions afterwards and I will I'll chat the questions and, yeah, and probably use a chair's prerogative to ask a few questions which I need the first. Okay. So, do you want to okay. Alright. So I'm Nazneen. I actually presented last year if any of you came to the Brit Lane Medical last year. Um, but that was quite different. My that was part of my PhD research which was on the period of 1947 to 71, and the role of literature and culture in the production of a Bangladeshi nationalist identity. Um, but from my PhD, I've sort of moved quite far onwards, really, and backwards in thinking about the Bangladeshi community. So uh, the project that I'm working on at the University of Oxford is looking at the East End of London from 1880 to the present. And it's thinking about religion and space and, and Abrahamic faith communities. And the project's really trying to think about how we can complicate the narrative of the East End of London, which has been up until now, about communities displacing one another so that you had the Jewish community who then left East London and then were replaced by the Muslim community. And somewhere along the lines there's a Christian community around it. Um, so it's sort of complicating that nar narrative to think about ways in which there was an Islamic presence much earlier than people realise. Um, um, so that's part of the research that I'm doing now and that's what I'll be speaking about today. <coughs> Good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Shahida, Shahida Rahman, and uh, I am the author of Laska. I wrote a, a book which was published last year called Laska. And this afternoon I'm just going to tell you a little uh, brief history about <coughs> who these men were and how I actually came about to write my novel. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll begin and then um, Nazneen, I think she'll be talking about um, uh, Victorian Islam, won't you? Uh, uh, just after I've talked about Laska. Okay, so uh, we'd like to begin. Well, here's um, a picture of a group of Laskars, and it's dated about 1800s. And uh, Laskar was, uh, some people say Lashkar, but uh, I think the English word is Laskar. And um, it comes from three words, basically, and they all have a, uh, a similar meaning. But it was a name given by the Europeans to describe non-European sailors. So it's widely thought that um, Asian men actually came to England after the Second World War. And in fact, a lot of people don't know that uh, there was already a small South Asian population in Great Britain uh, in the 16th and 17th century. Um, and um, Laskers were probably the largest group of South Asian workers in Victorian Britain at the time. Um, they actually came from the uh, Indian subcontinent and other countries east of the Cape of Good Hope, and that was the initial uh, East Indies. Um, but the word Laska by the 1860s referred to people, uh, the men, that came from East India. East India is today, present day, uh, Bangladesh. And uh, it also referred to men that came from South China. So Laska just isn't uh, an Asian story. It refers to a multi-racial crew that actually came from the Middle East, uh, Africa and Asia. So you can see um, this image here, it actually says, um, I think it's dated about 1800, but these are Malaysian, Suratis, um, I think it, you can just barely see the, uh, the writing. But I think most of them just have illustrations, you know, there aren't actually proper photographs of Laskars. 
Uh, but I think with illustrations, it, you know, it really does tell you uh, quite a lot uh, about these men. Now here's uh, an East India Company ship. Um, most Laskas were recruited to work aboard ships like these uh, under Laska agreements, that was Laska contracts. And uh, the use of the uh, uh, Laska started in the early days of the British East India Company, uh, dating back to the 17th century on merchant ships trading with Britain. So for those of you that don't know who the East India Company was, um, they actually established and set up trade routes to bring back nukas from other countries. Um, and in doing so, broke down the geographical barriers of the world. Now, ships that actually travelled from England to India, um, it used to take three to four months to travel to India. And uh, most of these ships were manned by English seamen. So once they arrived into India, most of the Englishmen deserted ship because um, a lot of them did suffer sickness, there was a high mor uh, mortality rate as well. Um, so this left ships short of crews, so obviously the, these ships needed to get back to England. And that's where these Laskas were employed to replace them. Um, a lot of people think that um, they were used as slave labour. Um, the point is, you know, Laskas were actually um, employed. They, they weren't forced to work on these ships. And I think in the East India at the time there was dire poverty and that's what um, led to these Asian peasants to actually find work uh, and you know these um, East India Company ships actually employed them. Um, so they, they weren't hired as individual sailors. I think you had a group of Laskers coming from certain villages and they were hired as a team of sailors. Um, and um, they were hired in Calcutta and they were recruited through a labour agent. They were, uh, he was called um, usually Agat uh, Saran. So he actually um, provided labour for these uh, British ships. Um, and uh, I think with... Um, sorry, I'll just take that back. Here's an image of um, Laskers at work. Uh, again, it's an illustration just to give you an idea of um, what these men actually did. Um, they worked in the engine rooms, uh, stoking the engines, uh, but the temperature could easily reach 40 degrees or more. Um, for some reason, it was considered that these men could stand the heat of the engine rooms because they came from hot countries. Um, but you know, some worked as cleaners, some worked as cooks, coal carriers, they owned machinery, um, but very few worked on deck because these men couldn't speak English. And I think the majority um, sometimes the entire crew was actually um, Asian. Um, it was their duty to ensure the ship was unloaded once they reached port. So um, many of these men were actually fed with the rotten food um, and it obviously caused severe health problems um, and their diet was very unbalanced. So um, those that fell ill were denied proper medical assistance. And I think, um, you know, at the time, um, some Laskers were very badly treated, they were flogged, they were hung up with weights tied to their feet um, and there were stories of Muslim Laskers being made, made to eat pork as well. Um, but there are other stories, you know, very positive stories where some Laskers did um, work alongside with British seamen and they got on very well with them. <coughs> so here's a 19th century image of a Hindu Laskar and he's selling Christian tracks, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what these uh, men actually did when they did arrive. Um, because of the harsh conditions and ill treatment on board, um, a lot of the Laskers, when they arrived in seaport towns of Britain, they decided to stay, and they didn't take the ship back home. Um, they chose a chance for a better life working on shipyards and railroads. Um, but many were abandoned by their unscrupulous employers, so they weren't paid. They were left to fend for themselves. Um, but there are others that waited for a return journey, but they often found that they had to wait for many weeks just to get the ship back to <coughs> East India. And that was a very small majority, uh, minority. The majority did actually settle in, um, in London and other poor cities. So they had to find ways of uh, surviving, and they eked out miserable ex ex existences 
um, such as uh, they became street sweepers, um, mu musicians where they played the tom-tom in the middle of the street and they danced in front of large audiences and they, and they sang in their own language. Um, there were peddlers, cleaners, artists, servants and beggars. Um, the majority did actually resort to begging. Um, and I think um, with um, you know, Laskers in general, um, th there were a few South Asian men that actually did come. They were very rich and they, they became uh, politicians or lawyers or doctors, but the majority of these men were uh, very poor and they lived desperate lives of poverty. Now here's an image of the, um, it's West India Dock, I think the top bit's been cut off actually. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's the strangest home for the Asiatics, the Africans and South Sea Islanders. Now a lot of the Laskers weren't able uh, to find shelter against these British winters, because at the time we have to remember that British winters were very, very harsh indeed. And, then, and there, were, there is a story where, I think sometime in 1811, where the, uh, the whole of the Thames River actually froze over and they held a winter fair on that particular winter. Um, so, you know, these men really suffered uh, quite badly. Um, I think in 1850 there was, uh, there was a story recorded, there was 40 Asian men. They were known as the Sons of India and they were found dead of cold and hunger on one street alone on one day. And that, that was obviously a miserable you know, sight to see. Um, some ended up living in hostels and uh, others had, those that did live in hostels, they didn't have any bedding or any furniture or any fireplaces. So this prompted the founding of the, um, um, founding the, prompted the founding of the Stranger's Home, this was the Stranger's Home and this actually stood next to the Limehouse Police Station. It, it doesn't exist anymore, this building, um, it's been knocked down. Um, I think it closed in 1937 because of the lack of funding. And it was set up by a Christian missionary group uh, led by Joseph Salter in 1857. Now these missionary groups actually went out of the way to help these uh, Laskars. Um, and I think they had their own agenda as well. Some of these Laskars were actually converted from uh, Islam to Christianity as well. And I think at that time it was very difficult to live a life uh, as a Muslim in uh, Victoria and London. So it provided temporary accommodation, so it, it gave them a place to stay, a place to eat, and a place to watch. Um, there are other um, men that actually um, went to live with English women at the time, so these English women set up lodging houses for these men, and they ended up marrying them. Um, and they were given nicknames such as Lasca Sally or Calcutta Louise, um, but they became outcasts in their own community, um, these English women, because they did that. And at the time it was seen as a complete disgrace to society, these mixed marriages, even though there were no law uh, against them. Okay, so I'm going to pass you over to Nazneen and she's going to talk a little bit more about uh, Islam in uh, Victoria and London. Um, I think we'll go backwards because I'm going to start by talking a little bit more about the stranger's home. Um, well, I mean, one of the points of our project at Oxford is really speaking to something that Amin Gulabai actually talked about earlier, which is polarisation within the Bangladeshi community. And um, really thinking, trying to complicate the narrative that says secular versus Islamist or... Um, and I'm kind of trying to do this by thinking about Islamic practices before kind of the most recent period. So we can, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a narrative that argues that there's been an Islamic revival in East London from in the very recent period, but that, that the earlier periods of settlement didn't have, you know, um, that religious practice wasn't as important or, and in particular when it comes to Lashkas, there's a general sense that they weren't religious, that there was um, actually that there was a lot of drinking going on, there was an intermarriage, and therefore that they weren't a religious practicing community. However, that 
period of history is like any other period of history about the South Asian community, and there's a kind of spectrum from that ranges from you know, uh, not practicing to practicing, and it's actually the evidence about about religion and about Islam in East London in this period that's not really been kind of um, recuperated from the archives. So this has been one of the focuses of my research recently. And actually, you know, as Shahida said, we don't have very much input to go on when it comes to the Lashkars. You know, we don't have photographs of this early period of Lashkars. And we also don't have... Um, their own testimonies, their own accounts of what it was like to travel on the ships and, and live in Victorian East London. We have Caroline Adams' immensely valuable um, Across Seven Seas and Thirteen Rivers, which is an oral history with later seafarers from Silet who were travelling on the ships from the 19th, 20s and 30s onwards. But we really don't have anything by Lashkars from this period. So, um, what, how do we get a clearer picture of what their lives were like? And one of the most valuable resources for us in terms of archival records is the records of missionary um, uh, individuals and institutions like the London City Mission that looked after the strangers' home and Joseph Salter's accounts. Um, he could speak different Asian languages. He could speak Gujarati, he could speak Hindustani, as they would call it then, and he could speak Bengali. He had a little bit of Arabic. Um, and he was the one of the few people who could communicate with Lashkar seafarers in their own languages. And as Shahida said, he had his own agenda. He wanted to convert them to Islam, both from, from Islam to Christianity. But um, actually, if you look at the London City Mission, records and they're very detailed about the work that he was doing in the docks with Lashka seafarers. Um, there were only two or three formal conversions during a 20 year period in which he worked on the docks. Um, and he rationalised this by saying, well, we hope that they take the good word of Christianity back with them on ships and that it is spread through the kind of transnational merchant networks that way. But you can, it just does demonstrate to you however much pressure was placed on Lashkar seafarers. A lot of them actually did resist conversion um, too. So this is one of the... Um, but at the same time, the missionaries are much more um, sympathetic to the case of um, Lashkar seafarers than the mainstream society was. And there's a lot of stereotypes about what Ashka seafarers were like. Um, there's a very much a sense of them being childlike, um, very docile or cowardly. And these are some kind of racial stereotypes that Georgie Weems has, uh, she's a ransom, uh, she, she says has been reproduced with regards to the Bangladeshi community in more and recent kind of um, media representations. Um, so that this is kind of remobilized, this Mohammedan fatalism, the idea of like being cowardly. And then you've got the example of them really trying to use kind of, trying to control and intimidate Lashkar seafarers on board ship and to use all kinds of kind of ways of throwing pigs into into the place they're hiding in order to get them out of the ship. And that's a very mild case. Rosina Vistram's book, um, she talks, she has some records of Lashkas, you know, being forced to eat pork or some incredible, you know, savage violence being undertaken um, against seafarers. Um, this is a, uh, I wonder if, Um, let me see, the order is a bit different. So this is, um, I mean, going back to Salter's um, records, this is part of one of his anecdotes about um, speaking to Lushka seafarers um, on the docks. And um, here you can see that there's a lot of kind of theological discussion that happens as part of his 
attempts to convert Lushka seafarers. So that um, uh, another example, um, aside from this, is about um, Lushka's asking him, well, wasn't Jesus a Jew? And they have to kind of then, he, he has to then talk about how the idea of a Jew within Christianity is very different to the idea of a Jew within Judaism, which is wrong, according to Salter. And, and also the role of, of um, Jesus as son of God, rather than as a prophet, as the Lushkas argue that he is. So there's the, these kinds of religious exchanges happening um, in the kind of 1880s in East London. And it's really interesting because this is, you know, Limehouse. And I went to an interfaith Tower Hamlets meeting where there was a policeman um, there. And he was saying he was walking around Limehouse and that some re someone, a, a Muslim man came up to him and said, are you a Christian? And he said, yes. And he said, oh, well, I really want to ask you about the Holy Trinity. And they have this discussion about Jesus as the Son of God, pretty much in the same kind of location that this discussion happened, you know, over a hundred years earlier. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting how these how these kind of in discussions about the differences between the Abrahamic faith um, have kind of been ongoing in, and enduring in East London. But um, what I'm really interested in in this particular. Um, description is the fact that there is um, a kind of resistance to the Christian narrative, but it's done in a very polite way because you know the, the missionaries are the only people who are able to provide sanctuary, refuge to the seafarers. He's Salter is a, in a kind of position of power in relation to um, the seafarers. So they're very respectful, but at the same time, they've got their boundaries and they will not accept, you know, um, the Christian truth. So there's just one diplomatic storekeeper at the end who says, oh, well, you know, we don't know enough. And, and he kept, keeps everything quite peaceful and respectful. Um, and this kind of performance of respect is also then often sometimes strategic because as we said seen the the Christian the trap sellers that the image of the trap sellers that Shahida um, showed earlier, there is also accounts in newspapers of these trap sellers actually having acquired those traps from Christian missionaries and that they're using that as a way to gain an income and you know they're reselling them on when they were supposed to be using them for their own personal use so there is you know they're, they're also being fairly strategic um, in the way that they're performing um, <clears throat> but sometimes it's not as as respectful and this is one of the very few examples that we've got of 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 Asian of of a South Asian Muslim woman um, actually saying something, and it's in the in Salter's account, and she's she's really resisting the and, and obviously is offended by his efforts to convert them. So, I mean. You know, I, I, what I'm interested in this kind of period of history is really how we recuperate these narratives from from the fact that there basically isn't anything written by Laskers or or Ayers in this period. So this is a, a, a later image. This is actually from 1941, and it's Eid celebrations just up the road at the um, East London Mosque. So, um, and in this image, this is a photograph, and um, the accompanying records actually say that the, the congregation that came to celebrate Eve in 1941 was made up of uh, seafarers and merchant seamen and um, people from the British Indian Army who were from Sudan, Palestine, Yemen, and uh, and British India. So it's a really diverse religious group. Um, 
And this is a really interesting um, example from 1910 of, of uh, Lusker seafarers preying on deck and using the kind of the public space of the ship for their religious purposes. And, you know, from this you can see how large sometimes the, the proportion of a crew might be who, who were Muslim. And this is going back in time a bit. This is 1882, uh, 1892. Um, and this is a, a very caricatured image, but um, an example of more of being celebrated on the docks um, by Shia and um, possibly also Sunni Muslims during this period. Um, and it's accompanied by a really detailed article in which the reporter from the graphic um, goes to various ships where Lashka seafarers are actually preparing for this, for this um, celebration. And it, because it's during the time that there were various invasions of Egypt and the Ottoman Empire happening, this is a period where they think there was an unusually large number of Lashkas in East London. And they think about 20, there were about 2,000 who participated in this festival in 1892. So at various points, it's actually a really large, visible community, um, even if they might go back and then it would be a smaller community. But there is actually a really visible presence of a of, um, Muslim religious festival in the docks. But what was interesting about this particular year was that because of violence that had happened when the general public had been witnessing this, the Muharram festival, which happened annually on the docks um, since about the 1850s, um, <clears throat> they, they had had to cordon off the procession route. And, um, and bar the general public from actually wit witnessing it this year because you know they'd undergone so much violence in previous years so so the, the whole thing was kind of unobserved by the general public this year but they did various routes and they visited the East India Company offices en route and were given double rations um, in order f you know to recognize that it was a, a religious festival so they had lamb apparently and um, there's a really interesting little detail about one of the Luskas being interviewed by the reporter and, and he said oh well we've celebrated Muharram here and we've celebrated it in lots of other different ports and have to say that the the quality of tissue paper that we use to create the different um, banners and everything and in, in England is nowhere near as good as in, that in Bombay and I really love that kind of comment that makes me think that they, you know, they, they go to various different transnational kind of ports and are still kind of performing different their religious duties. Excuse me. Yeah. Who are Laska? Is not a Bengali war. Lashka. Um, Shahida talked about it earlier. Lashka. 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 Yeah. Who are the people of Lashka? Sorry, I wasn't here. Oh, okay. Um, well, the, it was a it was a term that was used for um, merchant seafarers that were generally from Surat or from Silat, um, but can also be referred to um, people from Malaysia or mm -hmm. Indonesia. Different people. Yeah. If they call them Lasker. Yeah. But predominantly, they're from Surat and Gujarat, uh, Surat and Gujarat, Surat and Silet, yes. and Silet. Silet. So, yeah. But actually, especially in the earlier period, the one kind of apart from the Chinese, which they sometimes would call something else as well, and I can't remember the term. But um, in the Bengali, they call it Kalashi. Kalashi. Yeah, and that's from Persian. That's the a, that's a, is a helping hand for the ships. Yes, and that, that, that's derived from the Persian. The inside the furnace. Yes, I think Shahidah was uh, had that yeah. detail well, earlier. Yeah. 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 Yes, <laughs> it's militiamen. I know. So it's got that kind of military, yes, it's a military, uh, term. military term, but it's been 
in this period generally used with right. the merchant. Yeah, generalized it on the ship. Merchant Navy. Asiatic. Yes. Is the last word derived from the Urdu? No. <laughs> it's got a multiple derivation. We go back to the slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's you take questions later. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Later. Yeah. You can. There you go. That's, that's for you. So it's similar, basically. You know, with the Arabic word and the Persian word yeah. and the Portuguese word. So it had to do with like military and army, but it was a name given by uh, the. Uh, yeah, sorry. It was a name given by the English, and they named them Lashkar. Yes. That's right. So it referred to these Asian uh, seamen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, I haven't got much left to say. So my final point is really about this image because uh, it, it's a very caricatured image. It shows. Muslims as being quite fanatical, barbaric in some ways, um, frenzied. And so my question really to um, go back to Shahida is that we have like all these different challenges when it comes to thinking through historical methodologies and the way we approach the Lashkar as he's represented in the historical record. Um, we can see that in the, the reports of, of Lashka coward, cowardliness, there's all these racial stereotypes being mobilized. So how do we actually get to any kind of truth about what it was like to be working on those ships and to um, be constantly traveling between South Asia and the imperial metropole, the center of the empire? What's it, what was it really like for these men um, living on these ships um, and then and struggling to survive in East London? And how do we actually recuperate any idea of the, their, kind, their history? Um, I mean, these, these are histories that are not written. They're not there for us to find in an archive in the way that, you know, the East India Company's profits are all there for us to to uncover, you know, how, what kind of methods do we have to use to try and imagine their um, Laska lives? And I think that's why, for me, Shahida's novel is so valuable, because it's really that we have to use some kind of imagination, we have to use creativity in order to actually try and recuperate some idea of what it would have been like in Victorian East London from these marginal uh, voices. So if, if we want to just, you know, if we want to recuperate something from the silence within the historical record, then we have to use different methods to do that. So I'm going to now give it back to Shaida so she can talk about it. Okay, um, I, I just wanted to add to something further from what Nazneen said. Uh, at the time, uh, Muslims were called uh, Mohammedans. Um, I don't think Islam was really sort of used as a, uh, a general word, but I, I, they were seen as wicked people, you know, they, they weren't fit for proper housing, and uh, there was a lot of uh, prejudice um, amongst these men, as Nazneen has explained. Um, you know, some, I think the word was darky, you know, that was a very common word that was used. I don't used. know if it was a religious um, connotation rather than it was just the darkness and a racial connotation, and I think actually the PO were very keen to say that it was actually the Islamic um, it was the Muslim Laskars that were the, the most obedient and the most docile because they didn't drink so that they, they were the ones that were very keen on employing because they were sober compared to a lot of the kind of white yeah, um, so there's kind of there are different yes, I, I think there are you know a few records that uh, you know are based on Lascar accounts. I think I found it very hard at the time when I was doing research for my people. Um, you know, uh, why did I decide to write uh, a fictional novel? Just as Nazneen says, that, you know, there's not a lot of um, recorded information about Lascar's in Victorian England. That's the reason why I decided to make that into a fictional novel. You, you can take a bit of history and make it very interesting. Take it any way you want, as long as you stick to the timeline. 
but I thought it was the best way of educating people because a lot of people don't pick up history books to read. It's only if you need to use it for research or something. So I thought, you know, with historical novels, that's something you can do. You can educate people. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about this cover that I chose. It, it's, as Lee mentioned, the graphic newspaper. Now, this newspaper was launched in 1869 and it told the news in images rather than text. So this is where this picture comes from. And they're clearly showing Laskers on a ship. You can see they're praying in the corner uh, and they're having uh, a meal as well. But, you know, I chose that because it tells the story of my novel. Um, and uh, I think the paper sees publication in the early 1930s. Uh, but it was, a, I think, it's a very valuable paper where you can actually see what's going on through images. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, it, as Nazneen said, there aren't any uh, proper pictures of uh, Laskas in uh, Victorian England. Now, I had um, some illustrations specially drawn for my novel. Um, the, the main character is Ayan, and he travels from Silet to England, working on a British steamship. Now, he wanted to follow his father's footsteps, so he decides that um, uh, he wants to become a Laskar thinking that he would, you know, visit rich foreign lands and, you know, earn good money. Um, but uh, he decides to jump ship as soon as he lands uh, in London. And this image actually shows him busking in the streets of London. And as I explained before, you know, it's very common for Laskers to um, busk in the streets um, just to earn a living, to be able to buy food to eat. I mean, some of them are just barely scraping alive, basically, just to, you know, get some food, some bread or water or something like that. There was no one to help them except for these uh, Christian missionaries. Now, uh, I just wanted to also say that, um, you know, w with, um, when it comes to writing historical fiction, um, I didn't find a particular photo of Alaska. Now, when you talk about Victorian England, I just want to ask uh, everybody, because I'd like you to all join in. Now, what do you think of when you're thinking about Victorian England? What first comes to mind when you're thinking about England in uh, the reign of Queen Victoria? <coughs> Does anyone want to say well, anything? <laughs> yes. Poverty. Poverty, yes. I think that would be the number one. Um, Chimney suit, yes. Steam engines, engines yes. Revolution, yes. I, I think there's a huge change in the Victorian era. You know, there's a massive change. But um, I think we have to use illustrations today to be able to tell their stories. You know, I'm just surprised that there isn't a particular Victorian picture of an East End street with Alaska in the corner playing a tom tom or something. You know, I couldn't find one uh, picture about that. I think. You know, that would, if there was a picture, that would clearly depict uh, a typical East End uh, street in London at the time. But, you know, sadly, there aren't any pictures. You know, there's an illustration on my banner there, and you can see that Alaska's begging. Um, but um, I have to also add that these men actually set up uh, restaurants, cafes, hostels. Um, can anyone tell me when the first Indian restaurant opened uh, in England? 16. Yes, that's right. Do you know what year that was? It wasn't as bad as that, was it? It's 1810. It was about 1810. And he, um, it was Sheikh Deen Muhammad. And his father was an ex seaman and he married an English woman. And he became a Methodist preacher. He converted to Christianity. And he set up one of the first Indian restaurants. And I think um, it, it didn't last long. I think it closed down soon after. You moved to Brighton, yes. The shampoo, yeah, you seem to know quite a bit about that. Um, but uh, I think that was before uh, Queen Victoria's reign. Um, but then his, um, you know, that was the trend that he set. You know, these restaurants started to pop up all, all over East London. I think with Bethnal Green and Whitechapel, this is, you know, it has a rich history of Laskers, uh, where they actually settled here. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's sad that this history has been sort of forgotten and that was the reason why I wrote no the novel to bring out that history, to revive that, um, because I couldn't find any fictional novel about Lascaux itself. Um, so, one mm -hmm. of the, um, when 
when the whole Jack the Ripper situation happened, um, there were actually letters written into the national newspapers from people who'd been living in British India who were speculating that Jack the Ripper was a mushroom because he said you know, there's this one particular letter that says well, this is kind of this this kind of brutality is is very common in, amongst Asiatics and clearly um, this could never have been done by a, a civilized Englishman so that I mean later on they also speculated that he was Jewish because there was this description that he was dark and swarthy um, but one of the other speculations was that he was a Lashka. But they never did discover who Jack the Ripper no, was at the time, yeah. yes. And that was just a way of kind of projecting that racial anxiety that's right, and that period. Right. But, you know, that's, um, you know, but when you see like representations on popular television of, of Whitechapel, you know, the news, the recent television that's series right, Whitechapel. That's right, that's right. You stuff. wouldn't see one master in the corner or something. Yeah. Yeah, which, which is very surprising, but I think. Um, you know, we also have to remember that these men played a very important part in the First World War. There were about 50,000 Alaskas in Britain uh, at the start of the war, and they had to contribute to the war effort. Many had no choice but to. Um, but I, again, that part of history is being forgotten, and it's not talked about. So every time they have a uh, First World War centenary, you know, the, the anniversary every year, they never talk about these Alaska seamen who actually um, died, you know, perished on these ships, and, and, and they did help the the war the war effort. So, I mean, and they were mostly in the engine rooms, so they were in the most yes. dangerous part of the ships. And there was, I mean, there, there is a story. Yes, there is a story in First World War. Um, a true, true. There, there, there's a story where the ship was bombed by the Germans. The captain had died, but these Laskers were standing on deck waiting for orders. To see what to do next, so, you know that's how you know obedient they really were. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, I just like to sort of round off. Um, I'll be sending copies of my book over there. Um, but you know, it, it's a story set in 1860, and it'll give you a real insight about what a, a typical Lester might have lived their lives in England. Um, it's fiction, though, so um, you know, it, it's it's very entertaining, and I do hope that you'll uh, buy a copy. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Leslie? Mm -hmm. oh, Except okay. that it's a really good novel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a very vivid retelling of the history that I think is really valuable for us. Does anyone have any questions at all? Yeah, I, I was actually going to. Oh, um, um, it's not directly about the last ones. It's more about this because the last ones they were the all men. You touched on the very just mentioned the word I am. I was actually mm. before we mentioned it, I was thinking of asking you a question. The IS that were abandoned in the UK. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about them? Did they have any interaction with the Lashkars? Did they have any 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 connection with them, or did they came on the ship? Okay, well, that, those of you that don't know who Ayers were, they they were Asian Indian women that came from British India at the time, and they came with English families as a nanny to look after children. Um, and many of them, when they arrived in England, they lived with the English families. Some of, them were some of them were abandoned. Some of them lost their jobs, and basically, again, they had to fend for themselves. Uh, I think Anaya's home was set up. Um, that was in. That was actually in the somewhere in East London. First, That's was right. in Whitechapel. Yes. Then, when the London City Mission took it over, um, that was in 1900, um, and then it moved to Hackney. Yeah, that's right, and that's where a place where these women could go. Um, but again, the, these women found it very hard um, to go back. Basically, they had to find employment again to go back to India with these, uh, with these people. So again, that part of history has been not talked about, and it, it's, it, it's forgotten. And I think East London has that rich history uh, about these women as well. I mean, there's some interesting kind of details about the two homes. I mean, the, the Ayers home had different rooms for the different kind of ethnic um, groups that Ayers would be part of. So that there were Chinese, there was a group, there's a room for the Javanese and um, Ayers. There's one for Chinese Ayers who were called Amars. Um, and then there was another one for the South Asians. So that, that they could have their kind of own social groups and be able to communicate in terms of That's languages. Right. I, mean, um, I actually mentioned just very briefly about Anaya in my novel. 
she was working as a servant for an English family. Um, but I think um, that might be my next novel that I will write about, because again, it's a silenced piece of history, and that needs to come out, I think. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Um, thank you, that was very interesting. I, I wonder if, uh, if, an, uh, if, this, if, the, if an antidote is required in regards to the suggestion that the Laskers were specifically targeted by missionaries. Um, in George Orwell's book, um, down and out in London and Paris, towards the end, there's a couple of mentions of a Chittagonian sailor that he encounters in a, in a, in a, in a house for um, uh, um, men who, don't, who are homeless. Um, and it seems as if uh, missionaries were targeting all sorts of very poor people, very uh, marginal people. And I, I wonder if that's the if that's the if that's the route that they're coming in at it from, rather than the yes, I think specifically yeah. that's yes. I mean these men because they're so desperate, yeah. and you know they needed a place to stay, they needed to eat, they needed to survive. I think these missionaries did probably take advantage of them. But I mean, if you were poor and you didn't have any money and you didn't have any food, obviously you would take up any offer of help. Um, <laughs> homes in East London during that period. So there was a Scandinavian one, there's a there's a German one. Um, I mean, the, the, the strangest the, home is the, probably the most well known. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, obviously the, the Jewish community of East London was a, a major target of efforts for conversion by missionaries. Yeah. And actually Salter spent a couple of days trying to convert Jews during the week, and then a few more days trying to convert um, Lushkas, and he found that actually the Lushkas were much more respectful than the Jewish women that he used to have to deal with. He used to throw um, dirty laundry water at him and like, um, abuse him through run, make him run away through the streets of East London. So, you know, but they, they, they picked, you know, they had certain groups of concern that they, they would target whether they would be ones who would be more prone to drinking and gambling or prone to, you know, the, that were probably uh, different religious paths. So, yeah, it's only one part of their overarching missionary work. Um, I, I was just wondering, uh, why were these um, missionaries targeted in particular? Because it uh, I think I explained, you know, East India at the time was going through dire poverty, you know, there, there was famine. And obviously these men thought that that would be a good way to survive. I mean, it, it was an offer on their doorstep, they, they, it's something that they couldn't refuse. They thought that they would visit rich foreign lands and make some money and then go back home. So the majority of these men had no intention of settling in England. Um, but I think, um, you know, they were mostly Sinati men, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, I think the Surat, <coughs> the Surat connection is more obvious because it's a port. Um, and the Silet is slightly more puzzling because it's landlocked. Um, but uh, one of the, re um, one of the, uh, Caroline Adams speculated that one of the reasons that there's this sort of tradition of migration in select is due to the sort of vol kind of volatile agricultural um, calendar and that there were lots of periods where there wasn't food and that, that men did have to do kind of undertake internal migration in order to go and find work so that they would go to the urban centres and then would find that, that that's the place they would be able to then then they, they were given the option of travelling on the ships and fairly yes. lucrative but, but, work. But it did involve a lot of lies and bribes as well yeah. with the uh, the Alaska agent that actually took them on. So, you know, it, it wasn't a straightforward where, you know, hey, I want a job on a ship and can you employ me? <coughs> there was a lot. I mean, that part of history I don't think we know a lot about. There aren't sort of proper records to even know when it comes to you know, these Sinity men. Um, but I think it's also that, I mean, Jose was talking about the informal networks um, that facilitate kind of mo uh, mobility amongst Euro within Europe, but those were the same, they were informal networks that set, started up as soon as the first lush girls were working on the ship so that they would then get work for other people in their families or other people That's in their right, village. Yeah. And yeah. so that various villages became 
um, you know, the whole crew can hear you, and there's um, like a absent of men who would then be travelling on the ships and, and then later become quite affluent as, as a result of their kind of effort. Wouldn't you say most of the records from that time were a bit biased, apart from a few quotations here and there? The rest of it was biased against the Lash Yes, I, to be honest, I don't think I found one positive record about Alaska. It was only those that did very well, you know, ended up becoming great. Really, yes, uh, you know, they would have that, like um, Shade Dean Muhammad, you know, he, everyone knows him for his um, these shampoo bars and um, because he did very well, he became a Methodist preacher. And I think these stories stand out as positive, but it's the negative stories that's the most around. And the positive ones always are from the PO magazine or the PO representatives who are trying to justify employing. I mean, he, he was um, the surgeon of King George IV, um, I think, at, yeah. at the time. So that's why, you know, he's quite well known for that. Yeah, thank you very much, Lavinia, for your presentation. It's fascinating. Um, I just had a question about one of the slides which, which depicted a, a, a kind of a discussion between the Lashkar Muslim and the Christian. And, I mean, to me, I didn't... I, I, it can obviously be interpreted in various ways. And you chose to interpret it in a kind of cynical way uh, and attributed that to the power dynamic. I, I mean, my immediate thought was, I mean, at least we have stories of, 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 of times in history when the power dynamic was very different. Yeah. And so the Asian Muslims were respectful. I, th I think it's mostly newspaper stories. Yeah. yeah that they, they are the best source. But I think also the missionary camps yeah. are the most detailed yeah. into terms. Yeah. I'm not sure specifically why, why you thought that the cynical um, uh, kind of uh, understanding of that. I, of what took place there is the more is more is the more accurate. I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think I, was, I I mean I was putting a counter narrative to the one that Sultan is uh, presenting, really, and um, one alternative reading of it. But yes, I mean Sultan always talks about the fact that when he goes on ships, he's always welcomed and he's always made to feel like a guest. Um, and um, that there's great hospitality shown towards him and he's very conscious of being a guest in that particular context. I mean, he's one Englishman amongst this big group of Lashkar seafarers and, you know, if he, if he does things that offend, you know, they're the ones in the majority. But they don't, you know, there's very little evidence of it. Be, you know, there's a few accounts of when he says, you know, it got a bit dicey and I had to, you know, kind of say that that's not what I meant. But yes, I mean, for you know, there was an interesting dynamic between the missionaries and the seafarers. Well, but I think you can't deny that, you know, at that, in that period, um, the stranger's home was one of the very few resources that Lashka seafarers had. And, you know, they wouldn't want to then also, um, uh, you know, uh, lessen their chances of being able to have access to it later on by causing offence. And I think that imperial kind of power dynamic does structure the ways in which Alaska seafarers have to behave in East London. And um, so I, th I think that, that we do have to bear that in mind. In um, <coughs> Xinjiang, in India, it's a place called Kashar, and with a large community, the Kenyans, the Serbian, the Russian. Do you know about that? Um, a lot of them migrated to Sibet, but that's in 47. Do you see any connection between these Lashkars and that Lashkar that settled? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think the Alaska Act actually repealed in 18, uh, 1960, so it went as far as after the Second World War. But to be honest, um, you know, I don't, you know, really I, I've come across really them, yeah. I, I mean, I've heard that, you know, the. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. I mean, I've heard of, I've been um, told about them. Yeah, but I don't, I don't really know about the kind of ways in which they sort of the the relationship with the Sileti Lashkars. But I do know that some Sileti families do have the surname Lashkar too, and it, I mean, it's interesting because in the 1980s there were a couple of Bangladeshi journalists who were trying to uncover the the history of, of migration to East London and they argued that you know this had happened because of the Lashkar seafarers and actually 
that um, they, their report, I think it was in John and Mother, um, was really negatively received in that period because it, they, they were seen as saying that, oh, Bangladeshis are coolies and that we have this really kind of lower class kind of, you're arguing yes. we're lower class. I have to add also in our own community where people don't want to talk about Alaska because they were treated like slaves <coughs> of the empire. And it was a job where not normal people would want to do. So perhaps that's another factor yeah. why this but, history is. But then there's this different. Yeah. The, there's also this source of pride in the name Lashkar because it it was kind of it yes. does indicate yes. a kind of fearlessness, the pioneers, you know, who no, that word still, pride yeah. 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 So there's the kind of. Um, but it's still used today, yeah. isn't it? That word. It's yeah. Somewhere in Malaysia, they still use that word Lashkar. And they know who these, well, the when you're in the still exists in South Africa. Hmm. It's a bit, bit, uh, yes, yes. Family, yeah. uh, professionals. But yeah. they all come from one particular area. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to look into that one. Yes, I think so. There's too. no doubt that the uh, large curves are predominantly Muslim. The um, majority of them are. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, but the vast majority of them are predominantly Muslim. I do not find anybody Laska as a Muhammadan name. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the missionary record, records, um, there's a particular time in the 1890s where Salter notices that there are a lot more Hindus traveling yes, in the world. Yes. Um, but there is this definite p moment, and I have yet to find out why that is, whether there was some kind of... I mean, because the assumption was that Hindus would lose caste if they travelled on the ships, and that's why, um, for a long time, it was predominantly Muslims from South Asia who were doing. But um, some point in the 1890s, uh, Salter's walking around the decks and docks, and he says, "Salam to to a to a Lashkar," and the Lashkar says, "No, I'm not Muslim. I'm Hindu," and he's taken aback, and he's mm -hmm. he doesn't know then how to address him and he has to go back to all of his scriptures and actually then learn about Hinduism in order to be able to convert these new Hindu Lashkas that are appearing on the docks and I wonder if there was some kind of you know like uh, a scriptural kind of uh, permission granted for for various or whether there was some kind of famine or particular um, historical moment that meant that that was the period when Hindu Lashkar has become much more common in East London, but but yeah, but there were Christian and Catholic Lashkars yeah. as well. Um, so. Yes, and yeah. actually, yeah. Um, a lot they go. Um, <coughs> talking about the ship, um, mm -hmm. uh, the actual way in which labour is organised is very much on religious grounds, so that the Muslims and the Hindus were always in the underground, unseen, yeah. Yeah, um, the and the, the the actual the Christian South Asians from Goa, um, Kerala were the ones who'd be above serving on deck because they would be seen as the ones who could interact better with the white seafarers. Okay, any more questions? Look at the whole context of the English and indentured labourers as well. I mean, to understand the national recruitment in the context of the greater labour movement in South Asia and the British Empire. So looking at the increase in Hindus at that particular mm. period, so yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it probably is kind of contemporary. I think we, we just covered a brief history. <laughs> There's so much more to cover. It'll take us all night to get through it. Um, but it's just to give you an idea of uh, you know their history and what they're about. Any other, any other questions? Anybody? Can I yes, please do. When you wrote your book, yes, the research that you're doing. Why are you talking about the UK as like the research you've got? Did you not go? Like into any other countries and look at their history. Um, I didn't actually. I think most of the records are actually based here, you know, in London. You know, I looked at the Maritime Museum. There are records there. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like so long ago that I think I did that about six years ago or something. Um, but I think you know, it was very hard. I have to say, you know, um, with illustrations, they can be exaggerated. With photographs, photos speak for themselves, basically. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I had to look at records where, so I could get into a mind of Alaska, you know, to see how they might have lived their lives, you know, it, it, it was 
quite difficult to get that information together. But that's why I used it as an imaginary story, what might have happened to a typical Alaska. Yeah. I mean, I think that missionary and colonial records are <laughs> the way in which the British actually did rule India. I mean, they always say that it was actually the awe-inspiring bureaucracy that, that actually enabled the British to manage India. Um, and, you know, the, the missionary records are a very similar kind of epistemological project where they kind of, um, you, you know, through writing, get to know what's happening in the, the Lascar mind trend. But um, I know that there are records also in Bombay and in Kolkata that I really would like to um, go and look at to match and to kind of really map that journey of the Lashkas in the archives from those archives to the ones that, are, that we have here. Um, but I'm not quite sure whether they'll be similarly fruitful. I don't, I very much doubt that in Egypt or, you know, in the other kinds of imperial ports that they would have worked and that there'd be that same kind of richness of of material. I mean, <laughs> I'm saying relative richness because even when we're talking about massive kind of records I mean, uh, of the of British India, you know, the representation of Las Vegas is very minimal. So that's right. Any other questions? Anybody? Yes. Presentation both of them are really interesting. It's really interesting sort of methodological challenges and concerns that you can bring with. Um, and I want to ask about two things really. That one is about this idea of the sort of racialized representations of, uh, of the Lashkars. And uh, Delwa sort of took the words out of my mouth really. I really thought about down and out in Paris and London and the reaction of the, these, um, I suppose, the tramps but mainly white men to the, to the missionaries who, who gave them charity and tried to convert them. And their resistance against them was very similar to the kind of things which they kind of bit their tongues and took a cup of tea and then complained about the market. And in the same way, the brutality on ship that you, you described, I think you know, the, the British Navy has a long history of brutality towards people who that's work right. for, whether they're allowed that's to right. or not. So it's important not to sort of essentialize the experience of well, you, you know, you have to say they're not all negative stories. You know, you know many were, you know, brutally punished. Mm -hmm. But again, there are positive stories where one some is white, white sailors and other types of subalterns, mm -hmm. working class white, were also brutally punished. Yes, and, and yes, it just wasn't, you know, the Asian uh, Lascars. Um, you know, that, that that's a good point that you actually make. But I think, you know, obviously, you know, there are no records probably of white. Uh, sailors being punished or something. Oh, I don't know. Th th there are lots, but that's something I didn't um, sort of research. No, but because, I mean, I mean yeah. from the example that I gave, this particularly inflected kind of punishment yeah. and targeted particularly to Lascar seafarers, throwing pigs into the um, engine room oh, is not going to bring white seafarers out of the yes. out of there, is it? So mm -hmm. force feeding them pork isn't going to do that. So there's particular kinds of you know uh, racially inflected uh, violence. Uh, yeah, and perhaps that's why that history has been forgotten. It's just something that people don't want to talk about. Because of the mutiny that happened. Uh, they were wrong because of that. They there, there was a mutiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of that, they said, okay, the only way to catch yeah. these Muslims or Muhammad mm -hmm. is yeah. supposed to be the pigs yeah. or for the pig again. That was sort of the well, As they used to say, those days, the bastards had. Well, I mean, the date of the setting up of the uh, Strangers' Home is 1857. Yes. And, and the missionaries actually, in the kind of very, in the, the couple of years, before 87 was saying, before 57 was saying, we see a lot of discontent amongst yeah, the seafarers. And things already started around it all over the world. That yeah. To get the barbarians but, into the Christian yeah. well, they, yeah. but, they, but they were warning the British government that if you don't improve the welfare of mm. seafarers, then something is going to happen. That, 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 that there is widespread discontent amongst the people working on your the East India Company ships. Did so. against mm -hmm. having on board. Yes, yeah. so they did. I think that yeah. came in the... Um, I think that was in the early 20th century, uh, yeah. actually. That came much later. There were protests. But there wasn't earlier on before that. Yes. There was, where yes. the doctors used to walk five, six miles, seven miles to the workers. There, there, there were riots as well, yes. There were at time against Asiatics serving on British ships. Yes, uh, you know, that, that's what I explained before. There was a lot of prejudice, you know, these English 
seamen didn't want to work with um, you know, Asian seamen. So again, there was a lot of proof. That's right. They, they were seen as wicked people. My second comment was really on the um, depictions of Victoria in London. You asked us about the words that sprang to yes. mind. Yes, do you want to tell me another word? about yeah. the, uh, the picture and whether it would have a, a letter in it. And uh, one of the things that's really nice about these his accounts of history is when they connect to the current day, I think Mezzanine ha a highlighted that uh, conversation with policemen. Um, but in, in the TV programme, East Enders, I mean, you don't, get, you don't get many Bangladeshis. You don't have any Bangladeshis there. So it's the family of Pakistan. So what's really interesting is I was watching this absolute Cod B movie. This is absolutely fantastic from the 1950s, which uh, 1960s, which is Sherlock Holmes investigating the Jack the Ripper murders. Uh, obviously. In a complete kind of meeting of fiction and history, um, but um, I was really struck that in that in that film, the uh, uh, East London represented in the 1960s was actually much, uh, the Victorian East London that was represented then was actually much more ethnically diverse. So there's there's a German pub owner, you know, I mean, it's not just that it's brown, you know, we've got such a large kind of European contingency in East London as well, and so that, you know, um, there's a German uh, pub owner, there's a Scandinavian leather worker, and then there's, in the pubs, you can see the Chinese, you can see um, Asiatics, I mean, it's a completely, you know, and almost like that kind of representation is, has, has then been re-whitewashed in some way, so I don't know, it's interesting to, to revisit. I think we have run out of time. Yes, thank you very much uh, for all coming on the